Welcome back. In our previous sessions, we've been talking about the written Constitution. We're taking a, a kind of a, um, a leisurely stroll, a, a guided tour, if you will, through the written Constitution from start to finish. We started with the preamble. We're now in the middle of our discussion of Article I, and in later lectures we'll talk about Articles 2, 3, 4, etc. in textual order. We'll work our way through to the end of the written Constitution, and then we'll start uh, strolling through the amendments in textual order, um, which is also chronological order, since the amendments have been, been added in chronological sequence. The guidebook um, for this leisurely tour um, is a textbook that I wrote uh, in 2005. It's called America's Constitution, a Biography. It's not required reading for the course, but um, uh, it is available to you. And if you want more details about the things that we're talking about in these lectures, um, more documentation and elaboration and qualification, citation, all of that, then do feel free to pick up a copy of America's Constitution, a biography. Uh, you can get it at most public libraries. Uh, it's also available at many bookstores online. I think a paperback copy will run you about uh, $15 or so. Uh, and, and that book, written for you all, for a, a general audience, um, tries to, to, as we've been doing in these lectures, walk you through the written Constitution in textual order. Uh, there are 12 chapters of that book, and we've been going through the book, in effect, chapter by chapter. Each chapter has a picture, and I think that picture um, is worth a thousand words. Um, it tells a story. Chapter one opened with um, a picture of the first newspaper printing of the proposed Constitution in September 1787. And I think that picture uh, captures some big themes that... People were paying attention to the proposed Constitution. The, the newspaper published that uh, imme uh, immediately after the Philadelphia Convention went public with its proposal, that newspaper uh, uh, editors understood the significance of the preamble in particular, which appeared in bigger type. And you see the great themes of the Constitution in the preamble, it seems to me. Uh, that's why we spent uh, uh, a whole chapter, really, on, on a single sentence. What are those themes? Democracy, we, the people of the United States. Uh, geography, it's the people of the United States, of a continent, but of a particular um, place. It's not we, the people of, of the world. And indeed, national security is a third and related uh, idea. It's, it's us, it's we, and it's us to some extent against them, against the British or the Spanish, the French, the, the Native Americans. This is about the people of the United States creating a project, um, ordaining and establishing a constitution in a very democratic way. Again, that democratic idea uh, in order, among other things, to promote the common defense. So again, you see this national security idea, and you see it all in this, in this opening sentence. National security, common defense will help us secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. By keeping the old powers of Europe um, at bay, we, will be, we and our descendants uh, will be free. We and our posterity will enjoy the blessings of liberty. And that was the preamble. That was chapter one. And I think you see those themes in that opening picture. Chapter two was about the structure of Congress. It was about the, the opening sections of Article One of the Constitution, the article about the legislature, and it was about the structure of the Congress, of the legislature, its basic size, um, its shape. For example, it has um, two houses. It's got a bicameral symmetric shape. Uh, uh, it, uh, uh, we talked about the apportionment rules in the House um, and, and the way in which the Senate um, was apportioned. The House is based on population. The Senate, each state, regardless of population, gets... Uh, uh, an equal uh, say. Uh, we talked about eligibility rules uh, for members of the House and Senate. Who gets to pick members of the House and the Senate? Uh, the terms um, for which uh, the terms of office uh, that these uh, uh, lawmakers serve. So we talked about the basic structure of Congress and we began that chapter 
with a picture, a picture that again I think is worth a thousand words, a picture that shows you a big building. It's a big building because it's designed to be the people's branch of government very distinctively and indeed Article 1 very early on echoes the preamble in talking about a House of Representatives from the people. When you look at that big building which is um, to make sure that the legislature is going to be of a sufficient size to be truly representative and democratic of the citizenry. It's a building uh, also needs to be big enough to, to house public galleries, galleries of the people who can watch the people's b business being attended to, so it has to be big enough for that. You see in the building itself the, the bicameralism. It's kind of a symmetric building with the House on one side and the, the Senate on the other. Uh, I think in our conversation about Article One, you saw also some of the, the themes of, of national security, the debate about the size of Congress, for example. Um, uh, it needs to be democratic, but you also want to make sure that the people there actually have some sense of, of the world. They have to be a select group, an elite group of, of, of some sort, um, in order to um, sensibly fashion American foreign policy, um, defense policy, uh, and the like. So you don't want the Senate too big because it's going to need to be composed of people who really do have a special understanding about the world. We talked about how, for example, you want longer terms of office um, uh, for senators than in, in, in states because, again, of the, of the need to develop um, some, some expertise. Uh, geography f fits into that story, too, just looking um, uh, uh, um, at Article One, you you see, for example, that there are not annual elections for Congress uh, every two years for the House, and that's part partly because it, it takes a while to get from the um, edges of the continent to the, the center. The, the Union is is much bigger, of course, than an individual uh, state. There's more travel time that will be required. That was the basic size and structure of Congress of Article One. Now uh, we're segueing into a new chapter talking about the basic powers of, of Congress. Um, and um, we begin uh, with a picture, and we're moving from the outdoor uh, indoors. And here you see Henry Clay. He's a senator. He's addressing the United States Senate um, in the antebellum period. Uh, and, and we see a couple of interesting things in this picture. Uh, we see that there's a public gallery up in the balcony, so the people are watching. The Senate didn't begin, actually, um, uh, as uh, an open body. Um, the House uh, was open to the public from day one. The Senate um, soon uh, followed suit in the mid-1790s uh, and never went back. Um, so the people are watching the people's business being done. Uh, uniquely, I think, among the three branches, the, the Congress is a, a, um, an entity very much open to public v inspection and deliberation. Um, that's less true of the executive branch. A lot of things that executive officials do, they do um, in secret, um, uh, 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 espionage and... and, and, uh, and uh, 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 f uh, negotiating treaties, all sorts of stuff that's not in the public um, uh, eye. Um, planning uh, d uh, um, n defense tactics, lots of stuff that happens in the executive branch, thinking about whom they're going to nominate uh, before they n name the person. A lot of things in the executive branch are, are more secret. Uh, the public isn't there watching the president at every moment in the Oval Office, but here they're watching the senators now, the senators also sometimes will be meeting in private in cloak rooms and the like, but, but the people are watching um, when the Senate is engaged in debate, deliberation. Um, and I, this is the age, especially the antebellum era of, of America, of, of famous senatorial oratory, of the great speeches that are, 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 are being um, uh, um, offered and listened to. So Henry Clay is a great orator in this chamber, actually. We see Daniel Webster is there, John C. Calhoun is there. This is a reminder that Congress is a speech spot. It's a, a parley place, a place for political discourse. In England, they call the legislature the parliament, from the French parler, to speak. 
So this is a place where not only people um, vote, they speak um, and they are listened to um, by the public. Uh, and indeed, in Article One, there's a. It's, it, we can think of it as one of the great powers of Congress. Um, it's not always conceptualized that way, but there is a clause in Article One that affirms the absolute quote freedom of speech and debate in the House and the Senate. And the idea here is that whatever Henry Clay or Daniel Webster or John C. Calhoun says today, uh, says then, or today um, Mitch McConnell or Harry Reid, whatever a senator says, whatever a representative says on the floor of the Senate, on the floor of the House, is absolutely sacred free speech. It cannot be punished outside that body. Now, if you misbehave and you say things that are inappropriate, the chamber itself might hold you in contempt or, or might discipline you, but you can't be sued in a court for libel um, by a private person who doesn't like what you said about um, him or his industry on the floor of the House or the Senate. You can't be put in, in prison by uh, judges or the executive branch. Absolute free speech and debate in the House and the Senate as there was absolute free speech and debate in Parliament um, in England. Now, in America, as we're going to see in later lectures, um, not just the, our citizen, uh, not just our representatives, but the citizens themselves have speech and debate, uh, uh, freedom. The First Amendment is the next free speech clause that gets going to be added to the Constitution. And this is going to talk about, again, this idea of freedom of speech, just like freedom of speech and, and, and debate. Um, uh, but the rights of the citizenry are a little different than the rights of lawmakers. Uh, there is an even more absolute freedom of speech and debate uh, in the House and Senate. Uh, no libel law at all. If in the real world a citizen gets up and says something that's intentionally and maliciously false, gets up and just lies um, to someone's detriment, there are libel um, suits that can be brought, civil lawsuits for, for damages that um, can be brought. But there's a more absolute freedom of speech and debate in Congress uh, under the Constitution. Uh, so this is a very special speech spot. And we'll talk more about that freedom of speech idea in later lectures. Now, I want to move from... Uh, Article 1, Sections 5 and 6 that talk about um, some of the special um, uh, um, uh, immunities and privileges of members of, of Congress to Article 1, Section 8, the powers of Congress. Article 1, the first article, is the longest article. Section 8 is within that the longest section. So now we're going to be talking about the longest section of the first and longest article of the Constitution, so something important here is going on. Now, the important thing is that the powers of Congress are very broad but still enumerated, finite. They are not infinite. Now, the question of how much power the central government should have um, and within the central government how much power the legislature should have, these were really important um, uh, issues in uh, the 1700s, uh, and they remain so today. Let me just remind you um, that the British Empire basically breaks up, in a sense, over this question, a question that's called the question of federalism, in part. What should the central government do? What should be left to the individual uh, component units? So in the 1760s and 1770s, the question was, what could Parliament do and what could Parliament not do? Before the 1760s, there had been a kind of a, a working understanding in America that Parliament could regulate imperial affairs, trade um, within the empire, foreign affairs between the empire and uh, the other powers of the world, France and Spain and so on. So Parliament could regulate that and local governments the, the colonies would basically deal with taxation and all, lots of um, in, internal matters. But then, beginning with um, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the Stamp Act or the Sugar Act and the Stamp Act and the Townsend Duties and, and the Coercive Acts in the 1760s and 1770s, Parliament get, begins to pass all sorts of laws that 
that it are designed to raise revenue from the colonies, um, to regulate internal matters in the colonies, and the col colonists push back. They say, wait a minute, you can't do that. And the British say, well, listen, if we can legislate for anything in the empire, like foreign affairs, um, like imperial trade, we can, if we can regulate anything, we can regulate everything. You can't sort of s draw lines and say, well, the central government can do only some things, and, and other things have to be reserved to the individual colonies. Well, the colonies thought somehow you could try to codify, constitutionalize, if you will, the working arrangement that had existed before the 1760s. The empire, the parliament, will deal with certain central matters, and other things should be reserved to the individual colonies. They, they tried to sort of propose that, uh, a constitutionalization, a codification of that working understanding, and the Brits said, no, um, uh, parliament uh, must be supreme um, in all cases whatsoever, and uh, take it or leave it. And the American Revolutionary said, well, in that case, we decide to leave it. Uh, now, the Articles of Confederation soon emerged. How are these individual colonies going to arrange matters among themselves? Because you're going to need some central coordination for war and foreign affairs and all the rest. Um, but on the other hand, the colonies individually want to retain certain powers. So, so how are you going to constitutionalize federalism uh, after the, uh, independence? And uh, what happens is an Articles of Confederation emerge. And the central government, Congress, are given certain powers, basically of, of, of treaty making and war and peace, directing common defense, and almost everything else is reserved to the states. And there's a, a clause that says everything that the federal government, that the central government um, uh, does, has to be expressly enumerated, listed in the Articles Confederation, and everything else is reserved to the states, each of which retains its freedom and, and sovereignty and, and independence, except for those few things that have been expressly delegated to the central government. Um, and here's now the dilemma. The parliament was too strong, um, and the colonies revolted. The Confederation Congress is too weak to do all the things that need to be done. Um, so now the Constitution is going to come along and try to uh, re rebalance the thing, try to get it just right. And that rebalancing occurs most obviously in Article I, Section 8, listing the powers that Congress has. Um, now, the word express is not going to, uh, expressly isn't going to appear in Article I, Section 8. So Congress is going to have not only the listed powers, um, but also certain implied powers that, f that flow from a fair reading of, of, of the listed powers. So that word express isn't going to be there. It caused problems under the Articles Confederation. So let's look at that list of express powers, Article I, Section 8. Eight, and let's just kind of quickly start to work through it, and then in our next lecture, we'll continue to, to work through um, Article I, Section 8, and the rest of Article I. Here's how it begins. The Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises, to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. Okay, so right off the bat, Congress is going to be able to tax us up and down and sideways. Taxes, yes, but not just taxes, but duties and imposts and excises. We've just fought recently an anti-tax revolution, and now actually the Constitution is proposing a, a pro-tax regime. What's up with that? What's up with that is this new Congress is representative. Ordinary people are going to be able to vote for it. The American Revolution, the, 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 the rallying cry wasn't no taxation, period, no taxation exclamation point. It was no taxation without representation. Parliament didn't represent ordinary Americans. Colonists didn't get to vote for Parliament, so Parliament couldn't impose taxes on ordinary colonists, revenue measures. That was the idea uh, of the American Revolution. Since, Congre uh, since Parliament doesn't represent us, Parliament shouldn't tax us. But now, this new Congress is going to represent us. Um, so it does have legitimacy to impose taxes on us. Remember, in the Articles of Confederation, excuse me, uh, in the Articles of Confederation, the Congress didn't directly represent individuals. Only the states were represented, qua states, as states, so only the states could be taxed. And the problem is they didn't pay. When they were asked for money, they didn't pay up. 
now individuals are going to be able to be taxed in, uh, when they import goods through the customs house or in other ways. And if the individual doesn't pay, then the federal government will be able to, to make that individual pay. That, that, that's a uh, fight that the federal government can win. It's legitimate because people are represented. So in some ways, not the absolutist power that Parliament had to impose taxation without representation, and not the inadequate power under the Articles of Confederation, really the, an absence of a power to tax, but actually now a power to tax individuals by a genuinely representative body. And why do we need that? The first sentence of the longest section of the longest article tells us why. We are gonna, Congress is going to need to have power to lay and collect taxes, imposts, du duties, and excises. Why? To pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. Note the echo of the preamble, common defense, general welfare. Here's why you have to pay, because we actually are going to need national security. That's going to require an army. Armies need to be paid. They need to have bullets and, and sh shoes and and supplies, that's going to cost money. So, and you, you Americans need to support a constitution, the Federalists argue. You're going to be taxed under this constitution, but you're going to be taxed by a representative body for national security. So in that first sentence of Article I, we see a continuation of some of the great themes of, of the preamble um, of the Constitution as a whole, democracy and national security. In our next lecture, we'll work through the rest of Article I, Section 8, and indeed the rest of Article I, and see these great themes of national security and, and geography and democracy playing out. We'll also talk a little bit more about slavery in Article I. See you then. Welcome back. We're in the middle of a conversation about the longest section of the longest article of the Constitution, Article I, Section 8, which uh, catalogs, enumerates the powers of Congress, the powers of Congress mainly vis-a-vis -vis the states, addressing a federalism question, how much should the central government do, how much should be left to the individual state governments, but also in the process uh, talking about certain powers that within the federal government Congress is going to have vis-a-vis -vis other branches. So there's some separation of powers as well as federalism dimensions to Article I, Section 8 that we'll be talking about. We began by talking about the first sentence, a sentence that says Congress is going to be able to tax us up and down and sideways. Taxes, duties, imposts, and excises. Why? In order to pay the debts of the United States uh, promote general welfare, and especially uh, provide for common defense. Um, so we're going to need to pay for national security, and, and the Articles of Confederation did not do a good job of that. Um, states were supposed to pay into uh, continental coffers, and they didn't do it, and there was no money um, uh, in, in the till. Um, the, the cupboard was bare. And George Washington and others understand that uh, when the next war comes around, if that cupboard is bare, America is going to lose its independence. He doesn't know when and how that next war might um, uh, arise, but he knows, Jeff Washington does, and his allies, that America almost lost the Revolutionary War. Um, that was a, um, they were very fortunate to have all sorts of um, um, uh, help uh, uh, um, uh, at, at key moments, and they can't count on that again. America is going to need to have the resources for national security, and that's going to require a government that has the power of taxation. In order to be legitimate, that government, because it's going to be taxing individuals, is going to have to be one in which individuals are represented, as they are in a House of Representatives. Okay, what's the next power? Congress shall have power to borrow money on the credit of the United States. Why do you need to borrow money? You need to borrow money in part because in a war, when everything depends on it, you might need to borrow, and if you and if people and and people aren't going to lend you money unless you can pay it back, and you can't pay it back unless you actually have a revenue source like taxation. So you see, begin to see how these things fit together. 
the next power, the power to regu- Congress has the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations among the several states and with the Indian tribes. Um, this is basically a power of foreign affairs. It's a power to regulate trade um, with foreign nations um, and with um, uh, Indian tribes, but not just trade. I think if you read commerce narrowly, it might suggest trade, but commerce can be read more broadly to suggest all matters, affairs, transactions. Um, So does that mean Congress can regulate all matters, all affairs, all transactions? No, all foreign affairs, that is uh, 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 affairs with foreign nations, all Indian affairs, affairs with the Indian tribes, all uh, um, interstate problems, affairs, matters, stuff among the several states. So this is not unlimited plenary power. The idea is that if something is genuinely international, the federal government should handle it, not the individual states, if it involves foreign nations. If something is genuinely a matter of Indian affairs, the federal government should do that because you don't want individual states riling up the Indians who might then start um, uh, being annoyed not just with that state but with the other states. Um, If something genuinely spills over across state lines, then that's the sort of thing where the federal government should regulate because it's the government where people from all the states are represented. Um, Now, on on this view of of the matter, again, Congress's power isn't unlimited. The the question is, is it really interstate and international or international um, or um, is it really um, uh, uh, something that affects um, our relations with the Indians, our affairs with the Indians? If you had a narrower view that commerce just means trade, economic stuff, stuff that travels through markets, then it's not clear actually where there is a foreign affairs power in the Constitution. It's not clear where there's power to regulate navigation, which isn't itself narrowly trade. Immigration, people coming into the United States, if it's not in this clause, I don't know uh, quite Um, uh, uh, where it is. Um, uh, What about when people want to just travel from one state to another, maybe not to spend money, but just to travel? Shouldn't the federal government have power to regulate roadways and and things like that that really are about um, intercourse, interaction um, among commerce in its broadest sense? among the states. And early on, Congress actually does pass a statute, a statute that makes it a crime for Americans to rile up the Indian tribes. And that's even in non-economic ways. Um, And if the commerce power is not the source of that statute, I don't know what is. It's not merely a statute implementing various treaties with the Indians. It's a statute dealing with tribes even with whom we have no treaties. So again, Congress's power on this view isn't unlimited and plenary. It's limited, but the basic idea is if something is really international or interstate, if it really spills over across a state border or a federal um, or a national border, that's when you want the federal government rather than the individual states involved. Congress has power to establish a uniform rule of naturalization. That's not about immigration narrowly, just people coming to the United States, say, to visit or or something, but but the power to actually make them citizens, um, citizens of the United States. That's the power given to the federal government um, to pass uniform laws on the subject of of, uh, 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 bankruptcies. Um, So again, to create kind of a, a... uh, a free trading zone with people doing business across state lines, having some interstate rules about um, debts, uh, debtors and creditors um, uh, in uh, uh, a continental free market. So again, this idea of things that might spill over across state lines. Congress has power to coin money. You might say, well, gee, doesn't that follow from Um, just the power to regulate interstate commerce, that uh, commerce might depend on a common currency like the euro um, in in Europe today. So uh, perhaps um, um, some of the provisions of Article 1, Section 8 perhaps didn't need to be specified. Maybe they were put in out of an abundance of caution. Some of them are also not just federalism provisions to make clear that the federal government can can do this vis-a-vis the states, 
but separation of powers ideas. Within the federal government, this is up to the legislature and not the executive. In England, for example, the power to coin money was a royal power, an executive power. And Article I, Section 8 is making it clear that in America, this is not given to the president, but to the Congress. Of course, the president is going to be part of the lawmaking process of the veto. We'll talk about that in later weeks. Um, so um, just some of the other um, powers that I think fit into our emerging story of, of national security and geostrategy, a, a power, for example, to establish post offices, again, to knit the country together so that there can be correspondence north and south and east and west, a power to um, uh, um, promote art and science um, uh, by um, things like copyright laws. Again, you want to have uniform rules about that across the different states so that a book published in one state, um, we know what the rules are for reprinting it um, um, in other states. So we have kind of one common um, uh, market with one set of intellectual property rules. Um, a power to constitute tribunals inferior to the Supreme Court. Again, a separation of powers idea. In America, Presidents can't create courts unilaterally. The legislature is going to decide how many lower courts there shall be, for, for example. That's, again, a separation of powers idea that here that's not merely left to the executive branch to decide, for example, as it was in England, how many judges there would be uh, and the like. Um, some big ones. Powers to um, uh, define and punish piracies and felonies committed on the high seas and offenses against the law of nations. Again, consistent with this idea that um, the federal government is being created for, for foreign affairs and national security purposes preeminently. Congress has power to declare war. Um, and uh, making clear that this is not a unilateral executive branch power, it, but Congress has an important role. Maybe certain wars might need to be fought in the event of an imminent invasion or something. It doesn't say to, just to make war. It says to declare war. So maybe cert, if fighting has already broken out, maybe the president has unilateral power to repel invasions. That has been our tradition. But this power to declare war is a congressional power, not an executive power, and of course it's a federal power and not a state power. We don't want individual states picking fights with foreign nations um, and deciding whether we're going to go to war against Germany or France or Japan or whatever. Um, uh, some interesting provisions about armies and navies. Power to raise and support an army but no appropriation of money to that use shall be for a ter longer term than two years to provide and maintain a navy, uh, to make rules for the army and navy. Um, national security, power to have a national army, a national navy, but note the difference between the army and the navy. The army has to be reauthorized every two years. So what's up with that? But not the navy. What's up with that? It's a geostrategic idea that armies are more threatening to domestic liberty than navies, so armies have to be reauthorized every two years. Why every two years? Because there's a House election every two years. So although bicameralism doesn't automatically mean you're going to get fewer laws, sometimes you just get more laws and law rolls and things like that, certain laws lapse. They sunset every two years. Army appropriations every two years the army appropriation goes down to zero. It has to be affirmatively repassed by the House as well as the Senate um, and then presented to the President. So, so a built into this is a certain bias against an authorization of armies. We might need them, but a concern that if we need them, they have to be continually reauthorized in any congressional election. If the people are tired of an army, they just, in effect, vote no, vote for members of the House of Representatives, who are opposed to an army, all the House of Representatives has to do is do nothing at all. And sometimes those legislators in Congress, they're very good at doing nothing at all. But if they do nothing at all, the army lapses every two years automatically. Not the Navy, but the army. No standing appropriations for standing armies. Um, uh, um, a, a very interesting uh, combination of sort of democracy and, and geostrategic national con uh, security concerns. Wrapping up um, much of, of what's gone before is a general power. Um, then there's some rules about militias. I'm going to talk about militias in just a minute um, and, and uh, the relations between the federal army 
and, and local militias. Um, but at the, uh, there's a power of Congress to uh, regulate um, a, a national capital um, so that it's not dependent, it doesn't have to be located in an individual state, but the national government can have its own capital city and, to, and the national and the Congress can pass laws to regulate that capital city. And then at the very end of Article I, Section 8, the longest section of the first and longest article, is sort of a general um, uh, catch-all sentence. Congress shall have power to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers and all the other powers vested by the Constitution in the government of the United States or in any department or officer thereof. At least two dimensions here. There is a federalism dimension that um, just a, a reminder that um, not all the powers are express and, 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 and uh, explicit. There's some implicit power, basically, to implement, to carry into execution <laughs> the foregoing, the other, the other powers that we've just been talking about. So there's little, some play in the joints. It's a federalism reminder that, that not everything has to be express and explicit um, in empowering the new Congress, as it did have to be express and explicit in empowering the old Congress under the Article of Confederation. So maybe one of the most important words in the clause that I just read to you is a word that's not there, express, explicit. That was pointedly omitted from this sentence. Um, so um, that's a federalism idea. Another federalism idea is that federal laws have to be proper. Um, so no pretextual use of federal power. So for example, could Congress use its power of copyright to punish newspapers it didn't like? Say, well, only c newspapers that support the administration will get copyright protection, but not critics of the administration. Use its power of taxation to go after critics. Uh, only newspapers that oppose the administration will be taxed in a certain way when they try to ship um, uh, newspapers from one state to another or something. But, but pro-administration newspapers won't be taxed. Well, I would argue that that's an improper exercise of federal power, um, and that's a violation of the necessary and proper clause, that federal power has to um, be exercised consistent with the letter and spirit of the Constitution. This was an issue that had arisen with Britain. Britain tried to, to leverage certain powers that the colonists admitted it had to regulate um, uh, trade within the empire and with, um, with other um, uh, uh, nations and empires. Parliament tried to use that as a way of raising internal, uh, raising revenue. Um, and the colonists said, no, we concede you can regulate foreign affairs for certain uh, uh, um, security purposes, but we think you're misusing that power when you try to do that to, to raise money for us. That's a pretextual use of a power given for other purposes. And the necessary and proper clause is a reminder that certain powers are given for certain purposes, and if they're used to do things that the federal government really isn't supposed to be doing, there is an argument that they're unconstitutional. So that's um, the necessary and proper clause as a matter of federalism. As a matter of separation of powers, note that the necessary and proper clause really establishes that, in effect, Congress is first among equals first among the three branches. It's mentioned first, and it really, it has power to, to pass laws um, uh, implementing not just its own powers, but also regulating to some extent other powers vested by the Constitution in the government of the United States or in any department or officer thereof. It's Congress that decides, for example, how many cabinet officers there'll be and how to sort of divide things up among the cabin officers and how much the cabin officers are going to be paid. It's Congress that decides how many courts there will be below the Supreme Court. It's Congress that decides by law the number of Supreme Court justices. Congress has the authority to decide what rules of procedure courts will use and what rules of evidence they will use. Congress has a fair amount of power not just to regulate itself, but to regulate the coordinate branches of the federal government. Uh, now, I'd be remiss in not mentioning maybe the most important early case ever decided uh, under Article I, Section 8 on the scope of federal power. The case is McCullough versus Maryland, John Marshall, Chief Justice John Marshall in 1819, and he upheld Congress's power to pass 
to create a national bank, even though it doesn't say bank in Article I, Section 8. But a bank was uh, adopted very early on uh, uh, by the first Congress, um, and, um, uh, and uh, uh, James Madison had some objections to it, but it passed nonetheless. And when the bank lapsed, actually, uh, um, uh, uh, James Madison was president at the time, and he actually signed into law a new bank bill. And one of the reasons he did is that it, it, the bank had been shown that it was actually very useful for national security. Um, that it's quite useful that the money is the sinews of war and having a central bank to borrow money on behalf of the United States and move money around um, uh, to give to the troops, very valuable power. And here's what John Marshall said when he upheld um, the, the bank. And you, I hope you hear in this um, a kind of a, a geostrategic argument. He said and, uh, that, quote, um, uh, we, we, we need, quote, an army, quote, to defend a vast republic from the San Qua to the Gulf of Mexico, from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Now, he, he's already claiming in 1819 the Pacific, you know, California and Oregon. He's already dreaming this continental dream, manifest destiny, the Monroe Doctrine. But what he said is in order to pay troops on site and on time, a bank is pretty darn useful to move money from the north to the south, from the east to the west. Troops need to be paid on time. A geostrategic argument for, a national security argument for the Bank of the United States. Unanimous opinion by John Marshall, all about, um, um, uh, um, uh, on behalf, uh, uh, interpreting uh, Article I, Section 8. Who's John Marshall? He's a guy who had been there at Valley Forge with George Washington. So you see, again, the national security and geostrategic thrust of, of Article uh, One um, a, a, as a whole. Now, I wanted just to say a couple of words about militias and then um, conclude with a few more thoughts about the last provisions of Article One. We have a federal army but, um, that's permitted, but it coexists with state militias to keep um, and state militias are um, a kind of counterweight. They can keep check on a central government. If, um, and, and in the event, the Federalists said, if, if the federal government ever attempted a coup d'etat, trying to use its, uh, an army to basically uh, just declare martial law and suspend elections and free speech, local militias would be around to resist, um, as local militias had resisted parliament during the American Revolution. But to be clear, this was a power only to be used in the event of blatant unconstitutionality where the federal government canceled elections, shut down courts, shut down free speech. Um, so ordinarily, if there's a dispute about what the federal government has done, whether it's acted properly or not, the solution is elections and free speech and court cases, um, not taking up arms uh, against a, the central government just because one state has decided that they think something is improper or unnecessary or unconstitutional. As we're going to see later on in the 1860s, state militias actually misbehaved. They took up arms against a duly elected government where there was complete freedom of speech and, and debate for, for their pro-slavery point of view, where courts were open and indeed controlled generally by pro-slavery forces led by Chief Justice Roger Taney, a, a pro-slavery Chief Justice. So we're going to see um, later on that, um, that th this militia power um, at the founding, which was reserved to the states, um, basically was abused. And we today live in, in the shadow, not just of the Revolutionary War and the original Constitution, but the Civil War and its amendments, uh, which reflect a much more pro-army vision of the world. Article I ends with some restrictions on Congress in Article I, Section 9, and states in Article I, Section 10. A lot of the restrictions on the states are in the name of national security. States can't raise armies on their own, can't keep warships on their own, can't send um, sh um, without con uh, congressional consent, can't sh send troops into war, can pick fights with foreign nations, can't um, um, enter into treaties with foreign nations. So consistent with this geostrategic vision, certain foreign policy and military matters are given to the central government and not the states. 
but there are certain things that neither states nor the federal government can do, a kind of early version of a Bill of Rights. Neither states nor the federal government can pass ex post facto laws or bills of attainders or titles of nobility. So an anticipation of idea that there are certain things that no government should be allowed to do. Now here's one thing, though, that's missing in general from Article I. Uh, there's nothing in Article I, Section 10, that says no state shall allow slavery. There's nothing that says no state shall allow slavery after 1808 or after 1876. There's no clause in the Constitution that says Congress shall have power to eliminate slavery in the states. Those turn out to be very pointed omissions. We allowed, the framers allowed slavery not just to continue to exist, but to, to entrench itself, to expand, to flourish. And as we're going to see in later chapters, eventually the, the consequence of that would be a civil war. Um, in our next lectures, we're going to talk about Article II, the presidency, and we'll see even there the influence of slavery. And that's, of course, going to help us see eventually what will happen later in our story, uh, namely the war between the states, the, the Civil War. Um, so stay tuned. Welcome back. In our previous sessions, we've been talking about the preamble of the Constitution, its first sentence, and Article I, uh, the congressional powers and congressional structure. We're now going to be transitioning into the next article of the Constitution, Article II, all about the presidency. We'll, we'll talk about the structure of the presidency uh, uh, and also then talk about specific presidential powers. We're going to talk about words, the very word the president, for example, but we're also going to talk about numbers. The number one, there's one president. We'll talk about the number four. He serves for four years. Uh, the number 35, uh, the, the age at which one becomes eligible for the presidency. We'll, we'll talk about the number of electors, how the Electoral College was actually um, uh, designed um, and why it was designed, um, how it was apportioned. Uh, so let's begin, um, uh, and eventually we're going to talk a lot about this picture, um, which is a, a painting of the Washington family, a very famous painting, um, which will actually, I think, sum up a lot of the features of the Founders' presidency. If you actually understand this picture, you understand a lot about the early presidency. Uh, let's begin with the very uh, word, president. Uh, now, under the Articles of Confederation, there was a presiding officer, a president, but he looked nothing like the presidency, uh, like the president under the Constitution. That, that presiding officer under the Articles of Confederation was basically just a fellow who held a gavel in the, the, the Congress, who sort of was picked by members of Congress and who rotated um, out uh, of that office um, uh, quite uh, frequently. Uh, that person had no independent uh, national mandate, um, independent of Congress, had no uh, veto pen, no pardon pen, no power of appointment, no direct superintendence of an executive branch of government, no commander-in-chief power, uh, no explicit authority to receive ambassadors, no implied authority to negotiate treaties and, and conduct foreign policy, no um, immunity from, uh, no fixed term of office, no immunity from being instructed or even re recalled by his um, state delegation, by his state legislature. Uh, so um, uh, no, no, national, no guaranteed national salary, um, a very short term of office, very different from four years perpetually re-eligible, no entitlement in, indeed to serve um, uh, 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 again and again and again without um, mandatory rotation. So that president under the Articles of Confederation was just the... the the faintest shadow of the presidency under the Constitution. So, so one question is, why did they call the person president then? And I think one idea may have been to slightly ease the transition um, from uh, 
the Articles of Confederation to try to persuade um, uh, Americans that this new system wasn't a total break with everything that they had come to um, uh, uh, expect under the Articles of Confederation. Remember that in Article I, the, the, the Constitution calls the first branch Congress, just as under the Articles of Confederation there's a thing called Congress. But recall that the new Congress is really different than the old Congress, as we talked about. It's a real legislature. It's bicameral. It's going to be able to pass laws. It, one branch is going to be directly um, uh, rep, uh, elected by, by ordinary people. A very, very different kind of body. Even the Senate, which is the part of the new Congress that looks most like the old Congress, insofar as the Senate is picked by state legislature, legislatures originally, as were congressmen in the Articles of Confederation. Um, uh, each state is represented equally in the Senate, as was true under the Articles of Confederation. So in those two respects, the Senate looks a little like the old, the new Senate looks a little like the old Congress. But even the new Senate, recall, is fundamentally different in that um, senators are going to be voting as individuals per capita rather than as a state block. They're going to serve for six-year terms rather than for one-year terms. They're going to be immune from, from state recall and mandatory in, instruction. They're going to be paid by the national government. They're going to be perpetually re-eligible, whereas under the Articles of Confederation, there were sort of mandatory term limits for these um, ambassador-like um, congressmen who, who basically voted as a block, as a delegation in a thing that looked a lot like the UN. So the Senate... The new Senate looks a little like the old Congress, and yet even there we see profound differences. Now, with the presidency, the new president looks almost nothing like the old pre presiding officer under the Articles Confederation. So, so one idea, though, is still we'll use these old labels, and that will make this new office perhaps go down a little easier with, uh, with ordinary citizens. Um, um, and here's a second reason. I think the framers understood that the first president would be George Washington. We'll talk a, a lot about why that's so. In fact, over the course of these lectures, George Washington will emerge again and again and again as someone whom, whom we need to understand in, uh, in a deep way to understand our, our Constitution. Recall that at the Philadelphia Convention that drafted the Constitution, um, Washington was actually the presiding officer of that convention. And there, he really was a little bit like the presiding officer under the Articles of Confederation. He held a gavel, but he didn't have all sorts of vast powers, um, at least formal powers, at Philadelphia. He had a lot of informal sway because everyone um, re uh, so respected him. Um, and indeed, everyone at Philadelphia and throughout the country knew that uh, Washington, if Virginia ratifies the Constitution, will be the first um, chief executive of the United States. He, 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 he towers head and shoulders above everyone else. And in some ways, they designed, the Philadelphia Framers did, the presidency for George Washington. Uh, and in, in this way, I think it was perhaps apt that um, they decided to call this new um, chief executive president because, of course, that was the label that George Washington had at the Philadelphia Convention. He was the presiding officer, the president at Philadelphia. He was referred to at Philadelphia as Mr. President. Um, and so I think maybe one idea is just they became so comfortable with the idea of calling George Washington Mr. President uh, in Philadelphia that they um, uh, uh, used that explicit label for the new office, the chief executive position under the Constitution that they designed for George Washington. Uh, now, um, one other related difference between the presiding officer under the Constitution and the presiding officer under the Articles of Confederation is the presiding officer of, under the Articles of Confederation, the president, um, if you will, basically was there when Congress was in session. But Congress wasn't always in session. It didn't always have a quorum. The new president is going to be president of the United States, not merely president of Congress. And the United States as an entity, as an ongoing entity, is always in session. Um, so I began by saying we're going to be talking about some numbers. Um, a key number is the number one. There is one 
and only one president at any time. That's not true of Congress, which is a multi-member body, two houses. Each house um, actually uh, needed to be big enough to be genuinely um, representative of, to enjoy the confidence of the citizenry. The judiciary is a multi-member body. The presidency is singular and unique. It revolves around one person. And let me give you a couple of other numbers. One person, 24 7 365. One person always there. Congress will go in and out of session. Courts will go in and out of session. But America is always in session, always needs a presiding officer at the helm. That person is the president. And there may be emergencies that arise, crises, um, uh, uh, foreign invasions, um, foreign policy crises, hurricanes, uh, uh, um, and, and the like, and those uh, opportunities. Maybe land will become uh, available um, in the West if Napoleon is um, suddenly interested maybe in selling uh, the entire Louisiana uh, territory to the United States. There are going to be unique challenges and opportunities that may arise. Um, and when they arise, Congress might not be in session. Court, uh, the Supreme Court might not be in session. They, they, they take summer breaks. But the presidency will always be in session. He's the president of the United States. And, and one important way then to think about this office is what sorts of things need to get done to preserve the United States as an ongoing enterprise. Um, and, and when you ask yourself that question, you can begin to see how presidents may sometimes, at, uh, at least temporarily, need to do things to keep the United States afloat, to respond to challenge challenges or opportunities um, until the Congress can be brought back into session. So one president, 24, 7, 365, always at the helm, always uh, in session, because America is always in session. Okay, so I've talked about some numbers. The number one, um, 24, 7, 365. Let's talk now about the number four. The presidency is a four-year term of office, uh, and at the founding, perpetually re-eligible. You can be elected again and again and again. And we might say, well, what's the big deal? Today you look out and most governors have four-year terms, but that wasn't true at the founding. Modern governorships, and I'm going to come back to this, have actually emerged as um, uh, m uh, imitations to some extent, um, echoes of the modern presidency. When the Constitution was drafted, no chief executive, no governor, um, no president. Some of the states called their chief executives governors. Um, uh, some called them presidents. The ones who called their chief executive presidents, by the way, had particularly weak presiding officers. Governors, as a rule, were stronger than presidents in the various states. But no state gave its chief executive a four-year term. Um, in the state with the most powerful governorship, um, which is probably Massachusetts, that's the one state where the governor had um, a veto pen that he uniquely wielded, it's a one-year term. Um, in, um, uh, in, in most states, it's actually a, a one-year term uh, uh, of office. Um, only um, New York has a three-year term, and now the framers of the Constitution are proposing to give a president a four-year term, uh, and they're creating a vastly more powerful president than any state uh, governorship because now this president's going to be able to pick his own advisors rather than be stuck with uh, a, a council picked by the legislature. president's going to, in fact, uh, pick his own cabinet officers. He's going to have a veto pen, which only Massachusetts has, a more powerful pardon pen than in most of the states. He's going to be commander-in-chief of the armed forces and going to be able to receive ambassadors and be head of state. He's going to have vast powers, um, vastly more powers than any state governor has, and now you're giving him a much longer term of office um, than most states. I believe, I think, 10 of the 13 states, I think, had, had one-year terms. Um, I have to double check on that, but it's something like that. So why? Um, oh, and he's independently elected of the legislature too. Uh, in in most states, uh, in eight of the thirteen states, the legislature picks 
the chief executive um, uh, rather than being independently elected. So, so why would you give him a four-year term? And I think there are two stories here. There's a domestic balance um, story, a kind of checks and balances story, and there's um, a geostrategic story, an international law, uh, international and foreign affairs story. Here's the domestic story. Remember that the framers are modeling their constitution in some respects on states, but then they're tweaking some of the numbers. Because of geography, uh, we're going to have a um, how members of the House of Representatives elected every two years and senators every six years because it takes longer to get from the extremes of the continent to the national capital, more travel time, because it takes a little longer to bone up on foreign affairs to actually learn about um, other parts of the country, other parts of the world. So you need to give uh, federal lawmakers a little bit more time in office to, to, because of the learning curve. Um, so, so if you're going to have and, and so in states, most of the st uh, uh, state legislators are picked annually. But members of Congress, House of Representatives every two years, biannually, senators every six years. So a four-year presidency kind of roughly counterbalances two and six. In states, if you've got a one-year um, House of Representatives um, and maybe even a one-year Senate, well, then maybe you want a one-year chief executive position. So there's a kind of balance within the state that your executive um, office roughly counterbalances the legislative term of office. But because for geographic reasons, in part, we're going to have a longer term of office for members of the House and Senate, we should have a counterbalancing longer term of office for the presidency. Um, now, um, there are some other, um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, here, that's the kind of the domestic balance story. The idea was we're creating a much more powerful legislature, a much more powerful Congress than we had in the Articles Confederation. So to counterbalance that more powerful Congress, we need a more powerful executive, precisely because this new Congress is going to have a lot more power. We have to break up its power with bicameralism compared to the old Congress and counterbalance it with an executive who's going to be able to keep it in check, for example, with a muscular veto pen. Many of the framers, led by James Madison at Philadelphia, thought that state governments had kind of gone spiraled out of control a little bit, that state legislatures were too dominant within state governments. They ran roughshod over rights. They weren't um, strongly enough counterbalanced by judges and by uh, state executives. And so if this new federal government was going to avoid the the um, the mistakes that some of the state governments had made. We needed to break the legislature up into two, um, um, break the old Congress into to two houses, and counterbalance it with a stronger executive who has a longer term of office, an independent mandate, a veto pen, someone who basically um, would resist uh, the inclination to, to vote for stuff that might seem popular in the moment but actually would be contrary to the long-term interests of the American people, to uh, considerations of justice and fairness. One individual legislator might not care that much about his reputation. No one's really going to notice whether he goes along or not. But a president, he would care about history and, and reputation because he'd be one person with all eyes on him. And, and so you want to kind of um, give that person a little bit more um, a, a powerful base to resist legislative encroachments. So that's the domestic balance story. The foreign affairs story is this person, your chief executive, is going to have to go up against other heads of state in the world. And they're, they serve for life. They're hereditary. And so you want some stability in foreign affairs. And so you want someone who actually is going to be able to look a, a treaty partner in the eye and basically say, listen, I'm going to be able to, I speak for the American people, not just in this, this month, this year, but more enduringly. Um, so um, uh, there's the domestic story to counterbalance the legislature and a foreign affairs story, both of which argued for a longer term uh, of office. Now here's the interesting thing. Once the framers of the Constitution got the American people to go for this, Two, four, six model, two year House, four year presidency, six year um, Senate, some of the states actually began to adjust and began to move away from annual elections for lawmakers to biannual. Um, now, as I said, 
in, uh, uh, in I think, 48 of the 50 states. You have governors who serve for, for four years on the presidential model. And that, that gradual shift away from annual elections to um, longer terms of office begins with the adoption of the Constitution itself. And shortly thereafter, states start to amend their constitutions to create longer ter um, terms of office for governors and, um, and now longer terms of office for legislators too. It's not just four years, though, remember. It's four years perpetually re-eligible. You can run again and again and again for life, no term limits. Now, today, the Constitution has been amended. A president can't be elected for more than two, two terms, ten years in total, because you could imagine a half term. We'll talk about that in later sessions. But at the founding, the president was perpetually re-eligible. Um, and, and in the states, those governors who were perpetually re-eligible basically almost always kept running again and again and again, and they either died in office or left office very shortly before their death. John Hancock, basically, um, uh, it's, it's annual in, in Massachusetts. He's the governor of Massachusetts. He runs again and again. He steps down very briefly in the mid-1780s and then keeps running again and again, and he dies in office. Um, and the governor of New Jersey, Livingston, again and again and again, and then he dies in office. Um, and the governor of Connecticut runs again and again and again um, and, and steps down a year before his death. George Clinton, remember, in New York, it's a three-year term. I think he serves six terms, almost two decades, um, steps down briefly and then is elected even for a seventh term. He ends up dying in office not as governor of New York but as vice president of the United States. George Washington sets a different example. He does not die in office. He, he got um, unanimously elected. Every single elector voted for him. We're going to talk about the Electoral College in our next, uh, next session. He got unanimously re-elected. He could have been, I think, unanimously re-re-elected in 1796-97, but he chose to step down. And in choosing to step down, he began a tradition which is going to uh, later become constitutionalized in the constitutional amendment of a two-term presidency. So he sets um, a different um, example than the state governors um, had. Um, had. Had Washington stayed in office until his death, maybe a tradition might have emerged in which the presidency became kind of a lifetime office as a practical matter um, instead of what it is now um, uh, become. So the text says four years, perpetually re-eligible, but Washington begins to establish a different tradition. Washington, in fact, establishes all sorts of precedents, therefore, not just as our first president, and he does all sorts of things that later presidents will, will imitate, but he also sets some important precedents as our first, pre he sets important precedents, excuse me, as our first ex-president. He comes to embody the idea of an elder statesman, who's available for advice um, if, if necessary, but isn't constantly intervening in um, national affairs. It allows his successor, basically, to govern peacefully, hands off power to someone else, and then fades back into the farm, uh, uh, goes to the ranch. Um, and, uh, and, and that model is not as visible in the text of the original written constitution, which, which as I said, envisions perpetual re-eligibility. It's a model, instead, um, that, that uh, is um, uh, embodied by uh, the, um, uh, the choices made by, by George Washington, most particularly to leave office, even though he could have been re-elected. Re In our next session, we're going to talk a lot about Washington. Um, we're going to talk also about uh, the Electoral College and how it's apportioned. We're going to talk about eligibility rules for the presidency. Um, we'll talk about, for example, another number, 35 years. And I'm going to end that session um, with uh, this, this uh, picture, uh, which is um, uh, from a, a chapter of the, the book, America's Constitution, a biography. We're now into chapter four. This is the picture that begins chapter four. And we're going to end our next session um, with a careful examination of this, of this painting, which is of the Washington family. I'm going to try to persuade you that if you understand the early presidency, you understand a lot of elements of this painting. This painting is going to sum up a lot of the great themes of America's presidency under the original Constitution. So stay tuned.
Welcome back. This lecture continues our conversation about Article II of the Constitution, uh, which focuses on America's presidency. It corresponds to Chapter 4 of the book, America's Constitution, a biography, which is our, our guidebook for this walking tour through the written Constitution. Uh, in our last session, we talked about how the presidency is vastly more powerful than anything that has existed under the Articles of Confederation at the federal level, and frankly, also vastly more powerful than anything that existed in the 13 states. Uh, most state governments pick their chief executive by the legislature, but in America, the presidency is going to have an independent base of power. He's not picked by the legislature. In 10 of the 13 states, the governor has a one-year term. This president is going to have a four-year term. He's going to be, per most states don't allow, or many states don't allow perpetual re-eligibility. This president is going to be perpetually re-eligible. Only one of the 13 states, uh, New York, has a multi-year term and perpetual re-eligibility. So that's a three-year term for their governorship. The presidency is going to be even more powerful at four. Only one of the states, Massachusetts, gives the governor um, and the governor alone a, a veto pen. The, the Constitution is going to give the president a veto pen. And, and so it's going to combine, in certain ways, the, the elements of the two strongest state governorships, the New York governorship, um, three-year term, perpetual re-eligibility, the Massachusetts governorship, uh, a pardon, a veto pen in his own hand, and it's going to add all sorts of, of additional uh, uh, executive powers to, to this um, supremely powerful new office that's being created. An office, to repeat, vastly more powerful than any state governor, yet much more constrained than an English monarch. Um, and we'll talk about those constraints as, as well. Let's talk um, just a bit about what the rules are for who can become president. So let's start with the property qualifications. That's right. None. Zero. Um, that's an important number. We've been talking about numbers. Zero are the property qualifications to be president. A person can be elected president even if um, he's not eligible to be state governor. And indeed, every state that has a governorship, Pennsylvania has a kind of a rotating executive council, but every state that has a single person as governor has considerable property qualifications for that office. Um, and of course, in England, to be the, the, the chief executive, you have to be basically the wealthiest person in England, the monarch. Uh, but zero property qualifications for the presidency, a radically democratic vision. Um, Let's talk about religious qualifications. In England, you need to be the head of the state, the defender of the faith. In America, there are no religious qualifications for the presidency. And indeed, a later provision of the Constitution say, says that there, in Article 6, there will be no religious tests for any federal office. This, too, is a dramatic contrast, not just with the rules in England at the time, but in the 13 states. Um, uh, on, uh, only one state, basically, um, has gotten rid of all religious qualifications. That's Virginia. In the vast number of, of state constitutions, religious um, uh, qualifications, religious tests are not just um, permitted, they're built into the state constitution itself in about 10 of the states. So um, remarkable openness to talent. Now, um, uh, uh, the people will get to decide um, uh, uh, whom they choose, whom they have the most confidence in. No property qualifications, no religious qualifications. Now, there is that thought that you have, that, that rule in Article 2, that a president must be a natural-born citizen, which means that he has to be a citizen on, uh, at the day of his birth. He could have been born abroad. Um, John McCain, for example, was born in the Panama Canal Zone, um, Mitt Romney's father, George Romney, who ran for president, was born in Mexico. But they were citizens on the day of their birth and therefore eligible. And you might think, well, that's kind of um, uh, a real restriction on, on democracy. Um, but in fact, um, and, and, and it ref may reflect some anti-immigrant sentiment, but let's remember some things. First of all, everyone who was already an American citizen, whether foreign-born or not, at the time of the Constitution, was eligible to be president. Alexander Hamilton was born outside the United States, not born, you know, as, in effect, a citizen of the United States, but he was eligible to be president. 
Uh, James Wilson, we talked about him from Scotland, um, born in Scotland. He's eligibly present. Anyone who's proved their loyalty to the American system the, the, by being here in the American Revolution is eligible. They grandfather all those folks in. Um, and and on, far from being anti-immigrant, they're very pro-immigrant. Seven of the 39 people who draft the Constitution at Philadelphia are foreign-born. Vast numbers of foreign-born people participate in the act of ordainment and establishment um, that results in the Constitution. Um, a third of the early Supreme Court justices are foreign-born, including James Wilson, four of the first six secretaries of the Treasury, including Alexander Hamilton and Albert Gallatin are foreign born. Roughly a tenth of the first Congress is foreign born. And remember, if you're a naturalized American um, who comes um, later to the United States after being um, born uh, uh, under some other flag, you are eligible to be in the House and the Senate and the, uh, and the judiciary. That's not true in England. In England, foreign born people are basically perpetually um, ineligible to be a member of the House of Commons or House of Lords or Privy Council or hold any um, um, important um, uh, position of honor, trust, and profit. But America's Constitution is open to a very broad range of immigrants, in part for national security reasons. We want folks to come, talented people, um, the framers did, to come from abroad and add um, their strength to the, the American project, to add um, their skills and their talents, their, um, their military capacity. Um, we want them to come here, buy Western land, and, um, and help us in the next war, which we hope doesn't happen, but uh, we fear might. And so it's a quite actually a pro-immigration document. Um, so why this special rule about the presidency? And I think the idea was ultimately, um, it was a democratic idea in part. They were concerned that a foreign earl or duke might come over with a boatload of gold and buy a presidential election because there weren't campaign finance rules in place. They associated foreign-born um, chiefs of state with monarchy. George I was born uh, outside of England. George II was born outside of England. Neither of them spoke English. So Americans tended to associate foreign-born heads of state with monarchy and aristocracy. And so they were worried that maybe some foreign aristocrat, um, uh, the second or third son of George III or someone like that, the Bishop of Osnaburg, was going to come over with a huge posse, a retinue of people, a boatload of gold, and try to buy himself an election. So, so they created a specific rule and grandfathered in all the loyal Americans, whether foreign-born or American-born, who were here during the American Revolution, the Alexander Hamiltons of the world, the um, James Wilsons of the world. Um, so, um, so we've talked about uh, no property qualifications. We've talked about no religious qualifications. The natural-born citizen requirement is actually an egalitarian idea, an anti-aristocracy, anti-monarchy idea. What about this idea that a president has to be 35? Isn't that a restriction on the people's ability to choose the most virtuous person? Isn't that anti-democratic? Well, not quite, because the spirit there was actually pro-egalitarian. Who could get themselves elected president at the age of 33? What kind of person would have the name recognition to do that? Now, note that they're not thinking about any specific individual. This wasn't an effort to try to keep Alexander Hamilton out of the presidency immediately because he's only 33. Everyone understands, to repeat, that George Washington is going to be our first president if Virginia says yes, and he's going to continue to be president as long as he's willing to, to serve. So, so it's not trying to exclude anyone who's currently 31 or 32 when the Constitution is, is being uh, considered. But there is a concern, more generally, about a certain kind of person, a famous son of a famous father. That's the kind of person who could get himself elected president, um, possibly at the age of, of 30 or 32 or, or 33. Um, who is the Prime Minister of England when they're coming up with this rule, these rules? And the answer is William Pitt the Younger, whose daddy was Prime Minister, William Pitt the Elder. And the colonists liked his daddy. Pittsburgh is named after William Pitt the Elder. But William Pitt the Younger becomes a member of Parliament at age 21 and Prime Minister at age 24. And he might be good and he might be bad, but he's getting it because of his daddy's name. And American, America's Constitution is trying to actually prevent that. Before you can be elected president, you should actually have a track record of your own. 
Um, so at 35, we'll know who you are. You can have held other offices. You can have been in the House or the Senate or state government or something else. You'll have a chance to show your stuff and be judged by your own merits. It's an anti-dynastic idea. And indeed, George Washington is picked as first president in important respects for anti-dynastic reasons. George Washington becomes father of his country because he's not father of his own children. Um, and this is very well known. Washington himself says in an in a early version of his first inaugural address, an early draft, and he cut this out because he was advised by Madison that it was a little too personal. Here's what George Washington writes, uh, in, in effect. Um, and, and what he's saying, um, uh, well, let me actually first read you the quote, and then I'll sort of um, translate. Divine providence, the good Lord, has, seen, has not seen fit that my blood, this is Washington speaking, should be transmitted or my name perpetuated by the endearing, though sometimes seducing, channel of immediate offspring. I have no child for whom I could wish to make a provision, no family to build in greatness on my country's ruins, no earthly consideration beyond the hope of rendering some little service to our parent country could have persuaded me to accept this appointment. That's what he says in his uh, first draft of his first inaugural address. In other words, trust me. I'm not going to try to create a throne because I've got no one to give it to. There is no George II um, um, to, to give um, uh, 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 power to. Um, and indeed, of the early presidents, you see, um, Thomas Jefferson, George Washington has no sons. Thomas Jefferson has no sons, at least legitimate ones that we know about who bear his name. I know little Tommy. Um, James Madison has no sons. James Monroe has no sons. Now, John Adams, you see, has a son. And his name is Q, as in W. And his son does become president, but only well after he's 35 years old. He has a track record of his own. John Quincy Adams does. Distinguished scholar, diplomat, senator, secretary of state. When John Adams leaves office, little Johnny Q is not even old enough um, yet to, to be eligible in his own right. Um, uh, I'll tell you one other, a couple of other sort of stories um, about their, their obsession, their concern with dynasty. Remember, these guys who framed the Constitution are were born American colonists. They were breaking away from England. In England, power descends, uh, is transmitted dynastically, you know, from father to son or father to daughter, Henry VIII to Elizabeth. Um, and, and they're trying to break with that. They've seen how, um, even in the House of Commons, so-called, power is transmitting dynastically from William Pitt the Elder to William Pitt the Younger, and they're trying to, to, to break um, 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 with that. Um, and they pick Washington in part because he is a break with dynast dynasty. You can trust him because he's got no son uh, to give a throne to. Um, in the election between Thomas Jefferson and, and John Adams, why, why I do people think, oh, Jefferson's the Democrat, John Adams is a monarchist, John Adams is a farmer's son. Thomas Jefferson sits on a mountaintop lording over hundreds of slaves, and yet he's the man of the people? Why is that? Well, Jefferson is actually very good at, at, political, at public relations, but, but here's another thing. Um, I'll read you actually from um, um, uh, campaign literature in the 1796 election. Uh, here's a Boston newspaper. It warns that Adams, if elected, would work to install his well-born sons as lords of this country. Jefferson, with daughters only, can be trusted. Here's another um, campaign sheet. Um, um, Adams has sons who might aim to succeed their father. Jefferson, like Washington, has no son. So all of that kind of concern, anxiety about dynasty is kind of packed into these, these, uh, this very compact phrase, 35 years. Um, so it's actually quite a democratic. As it's, it's hugely powerful. The geostrategic um, argument um, that we've been talking about is embodied in the presidency, creating a muscular presidency who's going to be able to stand up against kings and, and emperors and czars around the world. Um, uh, um, but it's also, and that's one of our big themes, how geostrategic the Constitution is, how focused it is on national security. But remember another theme. 
is how democratic the document is. No property qualifications, no religious qualifications. This president's actually going to be elected in, in, in some ways um, by the people. I'm going to talk about that in just a minute with the Electoral College. Um, and um, anti-dynastic rules, like the 35-year-old cla uh, clause. Anti-nobility rules, which is what the natural-born citizen idea is in its essence all about. We're going to pay him. Um, this president, so that um, low bo uh, so the people without vast amounts of wealth could be eligible to serve, just as we're going to pay members of the, the House of Representatives and the, and the Senate. Um, now, what about the Electoral College? You've been taught that they came up with an Electoral College rather than direct election because they didn't believe in democracy. But I've just given you a bunch of evidence that they really were Democrats at the founding, and they put the Constitution to a vote. We, the people of the United States, an unprecedentedly inclusive vote. And they believe in direct election of governors. And they're actually creating a presidency that will be a model for direct election of governors. And they create a House of Representatives that's directly elected in a way that wasn't true of the Congress and the Articles of Confederation. So I don't think it's actually fair to say, oh, they, they created the Electoral College because they really didn't believe in democracy, because they, they were afraid of, of democratic um, um, uh, power. So I don't think that's, that actually explains the data. And you've been taught, oh, the Electoral College is a balance between large states and small states. Well, the House and the Senate, that's a balance between populous states and less populous states. But not the Electoral College. The Electoral College, the big state guy wins every time. We've only had three small state presidents in all of American history, Bill Clinton, Franklin Pierce, and Zach Zachary Taylor. That's it. Remember, for the first uh, the first president is from Virginia. That's the biggest state. And then, actually, Massachusetts is the next president. That's the second or third biggest state, depending on your count. And then Virginia, again, with Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, James Monroe. For 32 of the first 36 years, it's Virginia, which is the biggest state. And for the other four, it's Massachusetts. And then for the next four, it's Massachusetts, which is the second or third biggest state, depending on you, how you count. It's not a balance between big and small states. It's not because they didn't believe in democracy. Here's what James Carver would tell you. It's slavery, stupid. That's why we have an electoral college. In a world of direct election, the South loses every time because a huge proportion of its population is slave population. So obviously they don't vote. But in an electoral college system, the South gets to count its slaves, albeit at a discount, the three-fifths clause, but still gets to count its slaves. So the three-fifths clause is built in not just to the House of Representatives, but the Electoral College as well. And it's going to end up with a presidency that ends up skewing very much in favor of, of the South. Um, so who is the big winner in this Electoral College world? It's Virginia. It's a large state that gets to count its slaves. Pennsylvania in 1800 has more uh, uh, free citizens than Virginia way more voters than Virginia in 1800. But Virginia has more electoral votes because Virginia gets to count as slaves, as do all the southern states, three-fifths. Our electoral college system is basically um, very much part of the three-fifths compromise, very much a pro-slavery accommodation in the Constitution. If, the, if this wasn't crystal clear to every American uh, when the Constitution was being proposed, it soon became so with two elections between a Southerner, Thomas Jefferson, and a Northerner, John Adams, as soon as jo uh, George Washington leaves the scene. And the South votes for the Southerner twice, Thomas Jefferson. And the North votes for the Northerner, John Adams, twice. New York is the swing state. First goes for Adams in 1796 and then for, for Jefferson later on. We're going to talk a lot about that election in later lectures, but it was clear to all that basically this is the South against the North, and the three-fifths clause is playing a huge part in, in all of that, as we're going to see in later chapters. Without three-fifths, actually, um, John Adams wins even that second election. He loses against Jefferson in the rematch because Jefferson is benefiting from the extra three-fifths that the southern states are getting because three-fifths is built into the Electoral College. So we have the Electoral College for reasons of slavery. We're going to come back to this again and again because one question is, should we continue to have it if that's what it's all about? Now, I promised at the beginning of this session um, about the presidency that you're going to be able to see all the great themes of Article II uh, in this painting. 1796, it's the Washington family. Let me just identify what some of those themes are um, and, and you see here. So one, 
the presidency, it's, it's a kind of a lonely office. Um, the president here is not surrounded by other presidents. Remember, in our previous chapter, we saw Henry Clay, and he's up there in, in the Senate, and there's John C. Calhoun, and there's Daniel Webster. Congress is a collective body. Present, one person. And he's got his family all around him, but there's not a, a Congress of, of presidents. And no one's quite looking directly at him. It's a bit of a lonely office, actually. Um, so you see George Washington. And what's he wearing? He's wearing his general's uniform. You see, it's a geostrategic and military office. George Washington becomes the first president in part because he commit, partly because you can trust him, and I'll tell you, uh, because of, of he has no um, uh, heir to the throne who bears th his name, no George II, and we're going to talk about that in a minute, but partly because he had an army under his disposal um, and gave it up. He was the only guy with an army on the continent during the, Civil, uh, during the Revolutionary War, and in 1783, he hands his commission over. He, he disbands the army. He goes to the farm. You can trust him. He's a general. He'll be able to protect you against the British. You see this globe down here in the corner. It's a geostrategic office. It's all about foreign affairs. And he's wearing his general's uniform, but you can trust him because he's not going to try to create a, a stage a military coup d'etat. He, he could have done that during the American Revolution and didn't. He's not going to be a Napoleon. Napoleon hasn't quite emerged on the scene, but he's, he's not going to be another. Um, uh, when, when Washington is elected, Napoleon hasn't emerged on the scene. By the time of this, this painting, actually, some Americans have, have begun to hear of Napoleon. Um, but he's not going to become a Napoleon. Uh, a Julius Caesar is going to make himself um, Emperor um, Caesar. Um, you can trust him. He's going to be big enough to, to go against uh, the Brits. It's a foreign policy office to defend us. All the early presidents, are basic, elected presidents, are basically battlefield generals or secretaries of state. It's a foreign policy office. Um, uh, John Adams was, in effect, secretary of state, a leading diplomat in the Articles of Confederation. Thomas Jefferson, secretary of state. James Madison, James Monroe. Um, all of the early elected presidents, all the way up until Lincoln, are either secretaries of state um, slash America's leading diplomat or battlefield generals, like Andy Jackson, um, like William Henry Harrison. Um, like Franklin Pierce, the only elected president up to Lincoln who's not a leading diplomat or a battlefield general is James K. Polk. So it's a foreign policy office. It's a military. It's commander in chief. It's about geo strategy. We see all of that. It's lonely here. Uh, it's a lonely office. We see the lurking presence of slavery in the corner. There's actually Billy Lee, um, uh, Washington's um, favorite uh, slave, whom he frees on his death, actually, um, setting a model, a precedent as ex-president, trying to, to set a model for his country that, alas, is not emulated by all the great slaveholders of Virginia. But Washington does provide for the freeing of his slaves, the ones that he owns at his death. And Billy Lee is one of them. But we see kind of the presence of, of slavery um, in this early um, um, a, a presidency. One final thing, what we see and don't see. This is the Washington family, and this is a step-grandson, Augustus, a step-granddaughter. They do not bear the Washington name. They do not bear his blood. They are not going to be heirs to the throne. That, in some ways, the saddest feature of this, and it, there's a certain solemnity here, but also a certain maybe sadness is there's an emptiness in the middle. What's not here? There's the rising S-U-N, the American empire on the rise, sort of. A, 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 um, so a rising S-U-N, a rising sun, but no S-O-N. Washington has no kids of his own. Um, uh, and there's so sadness there. That's what he doesn't have. But precisely because of that, we can trust him. We can trust him because he's a military officer um, who could have made himself president but didn't, who can beat the British. We can trust him because he has no son of his own. He has a lot of wealth and power, partly because he is a Virginian who does own slaves and marries a very wealthy um, Vir Vir Virginia um, widow. Um, so that's all part of it. Um, but the anti-dynastic feature is here too. Maybe the most important part of this painting is what is not there, namely an heir to the throne. In our next sessions, we're going to talk more about America's presidency, so stay tuned.
Hi, welcome to the second week of bonus materials for Professor Akhil Amar's constitutional law course. My name's Daniel, and I'm one of the teaching assistants for Professor Amar's course. I'm a second year student here at Yale Law School. Last week, we uh, had a discussion forum event in which a lot of people posted questions, and me and some of the other TAs had the chance to respond to those questions on the discussion forum. It was a really fantastic time, and we were really impressed by the volume and quality of the questions that you guys were asking. This week, uh, we wanted to take the chance to address a couple of questions that we didn't get a chance to respond to last week and do it in a more personal way um, with, uh, with me discussing them here on air. Um, so first off, I say that I'm not going to be able to get to even close to the full volume of quality questions that people have been asking on the discussion forum. But we just wanted to bring up a few that kind of highlight the sort of high quality discussion that's been going on. Uh, so the first question um, comes from a post originally by Michael Blanco. Um, and Michael asks, you know, we're studying the Constitution here, but is the Constitution itself even legal? Um, which is an interesting question to ask because when the Constitution was created, uh, the United States wasn't the United States. There were 13 states, and they were bound together in the Articles of Confederation. Um, when the Constitutional Convention actually convened in 1787, they were originally instructed to come up with revisions to the Articles of Confederation. And as Michael points out, the Articles of Confederation claims that in order to change anything, you need unanimous consent of all the states. In fact, here's what the Articles of Confederation had to say about its own amendment. And this is from Professor Amar's book on page 30. It said, quote, um, The Articles of Confederation shall be inviolably observed by every state, and the Union shall be perpetual. Nor shall any alteration at any time hereafter be made in any of them, unless such alteration be agreed to in a Congress of the United States, and be afterwards confirmed by the legislatures of every state. So that seems pretty amb unambiguous. Um, it seems that the Articles of Confederation said, if you want to change anything, you need the consent of every state. But that's not what the framers at the Philadelphia Convention did. If you recall, in Article 7 of the, Const of the Constitution that the framers created, they said that as long as nine states were willing to ratify the new Constitution, it would go into effect. So how was it legal for the uh, framers to produce a Constitution like that, that only required nine of 13 states to consent to it, when the Articles of Confederation, which you know, was a binding legal document itself, said you need every state's consent. Um, so here's one potential answer to that problem that uh, Professor Amar talks about in his book, um, and that's that the Articles of Confederation wasn't like the Constitution. It was really a treaty. It was a league. It was an agreement between a bunch of different sovereign states. And according to principles of international law prevalent at the time, a state wasn't obligated to follow a breached treaty. So, you know, they, if they'd entered into a compact with another nation and then that nation didn't honor its obligations under the compact, the first nation had no obligation to continue to honor its own. Um, so the way that the framers understood the Constitutional Convention, and possibly the best way for us to understand it retrospectively, is that they were addressing a breach treaty, that the Articles of Confederation was a breach treaty, that states had failed to honor their obligations under the Articles of Confederation, and therefore the founders were, every bit, uh, were entirely justified in saying, we're going to create a new agreement, we're going to create a new nation. Um, now, they were a little ambiguous at the time about exactly who breached and how, uh, and this was understandably a delicate question. Nobody wanted to be throwing around accusations. Also, depending on which states agreed to ratify the new Constitution, it might feel different which states you had to say had breached the old Articles of Confederation in order to make things legitimate. But in terms of the way to think about how, how was it legal for the framers to create the Constitution in a way that didn't seem to follow the procedures of the Articles of Confederation, thinking of it as a breach treaty is a good place to start. So another great question um, that uh, that wanted to address was uh, something originally posted by uh, Fernando von Hinke, and he asked about the right of states to secede. 
and whether the Constitution actually explicitly tells us whether states do have the right to leave the Union or not. Um, and this sparked a really fascinating and extensive discussion with, uh, I think, maybe even hundreds of posts. Um, and it's an important question and one that we're going to come back to a little later in the course when we talk about some of the uh, constitutional upheavals around the Civil War. Um, but it's important to think a little about it now. And um, here's the answer that Professor Amar highlights. Um, and that's that unlike the Articles of Confederation, which we were just talking about, the Constitution really wasn't an agreement between sovereign states. And there's several features of the Constitution that point us toward that conclusion. Um, so one is the preamble itself. And the preamble doesn't say this is a compact. It doesn't say this is a league. It doesn't say this is an agreement. It says this is a constitution. It is constituting a new nation out of constituent parts rather than a loose confederation of sovereign states. Um, another, another piece of evidence uh, is Article 6, the Supremacy Clause, which says that the Constitution is the supreme law of the land, and nothing that any state can do will supersede the Constitution, which seems to imply that the states really aren't sovereign anymore. If North Carolina decides it doesn't like part of the Constitution, it wants to do something different, it doesn't matter. It's, it, can't, it can't repudiate the Constitution. Um, Another interesting feature of the Constitution that suggests a kind of uh, that does not suggest that the sovereign state relationship is not what we're talking about um, is the difference between Article Seven, which describes ratification, and Article Five, which describes constitutional amendment. So the Articles of Confederation, as we discussed earlier, requires unanimity to change the agreement, right? And that suggests that every state who's a party to the Articles of Confederation is Remain, retaining its sovereignty. It, it, it's not going to be forced to do anything new under the Articles of Confederation unless it agrees. But that's not how the Constitution works. The Constitution says, once you've signed up, once you're part of this new nation, we have an amendment process laid out in Article 5. It doesn't require unanimity. If three-quarters of the other states and then two-thirds of both houses of Congress agree to a change, you are going to be bound by that change. And what that implies is that the individual states are not sovereign anymore. They're part of a group, and they have to follow um, the dictates of that group, even if they don't like it. Um, a final interesting thing that Professor Amar points out is that the anti-federalists, the people who opposed the adoption of the Constitution, threw around this accusation a lot at the time of uh, ratification. They said, you know, this is we're effectively dissolving the states here. They, they, we're not going to have sovereign states anymore. But the Federalists, people who are promoting the Constitution, they didn't try to deny that charge. They didn't claim, no, 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 you guys have got it wrong. They said, yeah, that's right, and, that, that's what we're, and that's what we should be doing. Um, Federalist 11, which is one of the Federalist papers that were written to support the uh, adoption of the Constitution, specifically talks about the need for a strong and indissoluble uh, union. And so that's what, that's what both the supporters and the opponents, actually, of the Constitution seem to have thought they were doing, and that's what they did. Um, so then there's one final point uh, I want to bring up, and that's a question that uh, was originally brought up by uh, J.R. Uh, Sedevi, um, and that's about the Constitution's size and scope. And J.R. asks, you know, the Constitution is really brief. It's only a few thousand words. So how is it that we have such a short constitution? And then you look at modern legislation like the, you know, the Affordable Care Act, which is, or Obamacare as it's often known. It's hundreds and hundreds of pages long. How is it that we need to write these extremely extensive statutes when we created a constitution that was so brief and succinct? So this brings up a really interesting point about American constitutional design in that a, a, a remarkable feature of the American Constitution is its brevity. So by contrast, the Indian Constitution is 117,000 words long. That's 25 times longer than the US Constitution. So America's founding fathers seem to have made a very deliberate choice to go with a shorter document. Um, so why did they do that? And what can we understand about the project as a result? Uh, Jason Jones actually had a great response on this thread. And he compared the difference between 
writing a constitution like the framers did in 1787 and passing a statute today as the difference between creating a blueprint for a house and adding a sunroom. And he pointed out, you know, the levels of detail you might want to specify, the amount of implementation and specifics that need to go on in those two processes are very different. Um, and I think that that's really the right way to think about it. Um, to kind of drive this point home, I'll say one of the most famous lines in the history of the U.S. Supreme Court. So this is, this is from a case called Marbury versus Madison, which uh, is going to come up in this course. Um, it's from 1803. It's... Uh, it's, it's arguably the most important case in the history of the Supreme Court, and this is arguably the most famous line from this opinion, and this is what it is. We must never forget that it is a constitution we are expounding. Doesn't sound very exciting, right? I mean, you, you might think, like, if that's the big payoff, why am I taking this constitutional law class? But it hits at this idea um, that we've been discussing with this question, and that's that the constitution isn't a detailed code. It's not like the tax code, say, which specifies exactly what's going to happen in a lot of different circumstances. It's a blueprint. It's a framework. It creates the conditions for future politics. They're going to fill out the details. And quite possibly, that flexibility that the framers built into the system is why our Constitution has been able to endure for so long. So thanks for posting so many great questions. I'm sorry we only had the chance to discuss a few of them here today, but we really look forward to more events like this, more interactions on the discussion forum, uh, and more opportunities to hear what you guys are thinking about the course. So thanks so much. Hope you're enjoying it.